Welcome back. In this video, we're counting down every single town in the Legend of Zelda series, and this time we're diving into the top 30 towns. But first, here's some fun facts about the series so far. Of the 45 towns I've talked about, 15 of the 19 games have now been represented. The Legend of Zelda and Four Swords don't have towns, so that means there are two games yet to appear in this countdown. Only three games have been completely X'd off the list, so there's still 14 games in contention for the top 10 spots. We've also encountered 15 unique races, and that's not even counting the various tribes and sub-communities. By my count, that means there are still three races scheduled for an appearance. Although, spoiler alert, two of those are about to show up in this video. It's been fun to look back at the huge variety of Zelda towns and compare what makes them great. And I'm curious what people think about the towns in this video. If you like this kind of stuff, leave a comment below. Without further ado, let's get started. Number 30, Goron City, Breath of the Wild. It's hard to put my finger on the reason, but this is the least memorable town for me in Breath of the Wild. And I guess I don't mean that entirely as a bad thing, because I don't have a lot to complain about here. But there's also not a lot I care about, which is weird, because on paper this town should really appeal to me. I love the Gorons, and I really appreciate the effort that Breath of the Wild put into modernizing Zelda classics, so I was excited to visit the Gorons' hometown. But I guess I was just underwhelmed. It actually does look cool, and I like the Goron design in this game better than their design in Twilight Princess. I like the way that lava flows through the city, and the fact that the clothing store is called Ripped and Shredded. It wasn't until my second playthrough that I realized the whole town is sat under a giant Goron statue, but maybe that's because there isn't a whole lot to do in this town. It probably doesn't help that of the four champions, this is both the ancestor and descendant that I connected with the least. Which I think is the general consensus, right? I liked the trek up the mountain more than the town itself, but after the excitement of reaching a Goron town, I didn't spend much more time here beyond exploring the main story. It must be remembered that all of this criticism is relative. I'm not calling this a totally mediocre town, just a mediocre town by Breath of the Wild standards. Like all the towns in that game, the design and atmosphere are extremely well done. There's huge amounts of interesting and funny dialogue, and some decent side quests are sprinkled around the town. It just didn't knock my socks off, and that's all I can really say. Number 29, Hytopia, Triforce Heroes. Move over, Paris and Milan, there's a new fashion capital. Hytopia is the one and only town from Triforce Heroes, and it kind of seems like it's the name of both the city and the kingdom at large. Sort of like Singapore, Singapore, or Djibouti, Djibouti. The themes here are fashion and fairy tales, so maybe Hytopia is the France of the Zeldaverse. The whole kingdom is buzzing with talk of the recent princess cursing, and it's another town with lots of tongue-in-cheek dialogue. I've talked a few times about central hub towns, and Hytopia is maybe the prime example of what I mean. It's a bit like the castle in Mario 64, because it's not directly connected to any other game areas, but contains portals that warp you straight to the action. Hytopia does a good job, in my opinion, of giving you things to do between missions and grounding your experience. Now, remember when I said I would note the top 10 shops, then did that once and never mentioned it again? Well, prepare yourself, because we're about to see a flood of excellent shops, and here is one. Madame Couture's is, in fact, a serious contender for my favorite ever Zelda shop. I suppose this is as good a time as any to complain about shops in the Zelda series. I have two major beefs. Number one, in most Zelda games, I'm never ever strapped for cash, so saving up for a big purchase is not especially satisfying. Later games have tried to fix this by increasing prices, which has led to some inflation around Hyrule, but in earlier games my rupee stacks are almost always at capacity. Number two, most shops don't sell anything I want or need. Why buy hearts, bombs, and arrows when I can just chop bushes for an endless free supply? Most Zelda game worlds are designed around a few items which gate your progress, which are typically hidden in dungeons. Historically, the designers have struggled to imagine items that are actually helpful, but not essential to your progress, and items found in shops are often underwhelming. But Madame Couture solves both of these problems. The various outfits on offer are frankly the driving force behind the game's core gameplay loop. They're expensive, requiring both rupees and materials from specific locations, so they give you a reason to head out on adventures and earn the necessary ingredients. But they're also impactful. It's equally exciting to grab a new outfit and head off to test out its powers. Examples include outfits that allow Link to swim in lava, glow in the dark, or an Elton John cosplay that draws enemy fire in multiplayer. It's an evolution of Zelda shopping, and an absolute highlight of Hytopia. Number 28, Zora Hall, Majora's Mask. Zora Hall is the exact mishmash of wacky elements I'm looking for in a quirky side town. I feel like the designers of Majora's Mask were given more freedom than ever to take liberties with Zelda tropes, and this is a town that dared to ask, what about Zoras, but rock stars? 
It's Azora Town so exclusive you need a backstage pass to access half the rooms. Instead of a royal family, Zora Hall follows the trials and tribulations of a popular rock group called the Indiegogos. Well, their sound is actually more jazz than anything, but the bandmates follow a lot of punk rock tropes. The behind the scenes drama ranges from the trivial, like a bassist who wants to find a new sound, and a band leader who's resistant to suggestions, to the super serious. The lead singer Lulu lost her voice after her eggs were stolen, and is now practically catatonic, spending her days staring out at the ocean. Her boyfriend Macau tried to get her eggs back, but was murdered in the process, and now the whole band is in a state of disarray. Hanging over all of this is their upcoming concert at the Carnival of Time, which is scheduled for three days hence but looks increasingly unlikely to occur. Zora Hall is what I'd call a dense town, because even though it's not so large, every single resident is packed with personality. There's also two ways to experience the town. As an outsider, or by donning the Zora mask and entering as lead guitarist Macau. Zora Link has access to all the band members, and can explore the relationships between them all. Of particular note is the quest where Link can read Macau's diary to learn a song that Macau wrote, bring that song to a jam session with the bassist, and finally play it for the band leader Evan, who adds it to the band's repertoire, but only if played by another form of Link, as Evan is too prideful to take suggestions from his bandmates. That level of depth from a quest really stands out, and I think it's the mark of a pretty sweet town. Number 27. Romani Ranch, Majora's Mask. Alright, this is the one place I thought I might catch some flack for including, especially because I didn't include Lon Lon Ranch, but here's my reasoning. Lon Lon is literally just a family home, plus one guy who mucks out the stables, and then gets high on capitalist greed and then goes back to mucking stables. Romani Ranch is also a family home, but it also includes a woman who operates a doggy racetrack and a depressed guy obsessed with cuckoos. If you extend the invitation to the rest of Milk Road, you've also got the Gorman brothers, but even if you don't, that's multiple unrelated residents living in multiple houses. Plus, signs in Majora's Mask 3D refer to it as Milk Village, and Crimea calls it Chateau Romani's Village. For me, it barely clears that bar. Romani Ranch is 10 out of 10 memorable. Everything you do here is a lot of fun, the story is wild, and the characters are incredibly human. It's where you reunite with Epona, bet your hard-earned cash on puppers, and claim the best non-transformation mask in the game, the Bunny Hood. At the beginning of the game, you can only access the ranch on the third day, because a large boulder has blocked the entrance. But by the third day, Romani has gone mysteriously screwy and can't help you anymore. When you finally enter on the first day, the wildest story in Zelda canon unfolds. During the night of the first day, literal alien cow snatchers invade the ranch and kidnap Romani along with all the cows. She returns the next day, but isn't herself anymore. Whatever happened is a mystery, but her vibrant personality is completely destroyed. However, if Link teams up with Romani on the first day, the pair can fend off space invaders until dawn. That alone makes Romani Ranch unforgettable, especially because it will probably take several three-day cycles to explore all the dynamics of the situation. Also of note here is the relationship between sisters Romani and Cremia, as portrayed by the young and old versions of Malon from Ocarina of Time. Sisterhood is not a dynamic that's explored often in Zelda games, or even video games in general, so I thought that was pretty cool. Cremia, the older sister, is trying her best to be responsible for her sister and the ranch, and part of that burden means hiding the impending end of the world from her little sister. There's a touching scene on the third day where Cremia lets Romani drink for the first time, even though she had previously told her to wait till she was an adult. Romani is confused but happy, and Cremia just wants to spend her last hours on Earth with her little sister. On a slightly lighter note, Link can help Cremia deliver milk to Clocktown if he defends the ranch from aliens, and fend off the good-for-nothing Gorman brothers from down the street. Like I said, it might be a stretch for a town, but it's a top-tier location. Number 26. Minish Village, the Minish Cap. This is the smallest town on the whole list. Like, so small you wouldn't notice it if you were a regular-sized human. Luckily, Minish Link is not a regular-sized human, so he gets to traverse what is no doubt the cutest town in Zelda canon. It's the capital of the Minish world, and the buildings are crafted from mushrooms, old shoes, and dilapidated barrels. Apparently, the Minish can only be seen by children, so to the average eye, this town would look like a literal pile of trash. But you know what they say about one man's trash. This is one of my favorite looking towns, which definitely gives it a boost, but there's other points of interest as well. It's one of the few towns where a foreign language is spoken, and Link cannot communicate with the Minish until he consumes the Jabbernut. If only it were so easy to learn a language in real life. Afterwards, most of the dialogue has to do with Minish lore and hints about your overall objective in the game. But just take in the cuteness. This Minish has four-leaf clovers as potted plants. He's using buttons as plates. 
the elder is wielding a needle as a staff. The biggest issue with Minish Village is that there's no particular reason to come back after your first visit. So many of the best towns, including the best one from this game, are repeatedly woven into the narrative of their game, but Minish Village is not. It's a one-time plot destination, and for that kind of town to claim a top spot, it really has to leave an impression. I think Minish Village does make a big impression, at least on me, but it's hard to argue that it deserves to be much higher. Number 25, Kakariko Village, Twilight Princess. Honestly, this is one of the most truly bizarre parts of Twilight Princess. Not only did this game feature an actual cowboy ghost town, complete with saloons and wanted posters, but its counterpart is basically another dusty ghost town, but run by a Native American shaman. Like what? I'm all for experimenting and god knows Nintendo likes to try new things, but the weird thing is that this isn't a side town or a new design. It's literally the series flagship town. I can't help but think about Breath of the Wild and how excited the designers were to reimagine classic Zelda locales, and I'm just really perplexed by this design choice. I don't know, maybe this works for you, but I've never really liked the aesthetic, and also, hot take, I don't like the music. I can dig a remix, but this feels more like a distortion than an homage. My other complaint about this version of Kakariko is how empty it is. I actually feel that this is my running complaint about everything in Twilight Princess, from the towns to the overworld. I know someone is going to say that it's intentional, it's the aesthetic, and it really shows the damage and destruction done to Hyrule, but you know what? Breath of the Wild showed all that and still gave me things to do. Yes, it's haunting and melancholic to explore a half-dead town, but how fun is it when two-thirds of the buildings contain absolutely nothing? Okay, that's my rant, but I promise I actually like this town overall. There's kind of a found family vibe here, as the shaman Renato and his daughter, along with the town's only other resident, a bomb maker, take in the lost children from Link's village. Eventually, Renato also begins to care for Ilya and the Zora Prince Rallis. It's somewhat bizarre that the children never return to Ordon Village, but given the fact that they nearly triple the population of Kakariko, I suppose they're a welcome addition. They even begin to start lives of their own, most notably Mallow, the Sam Walton of the Zeldaverse. The two bits of Kakariko that are shared with other versions are its placement at the foothills of Death Mountain and its adjacent graveyard. Both are important to Kakariko's identity. It's explained that the Gorons had grown distant and suspicious of the humans in Kakariko, but after Link sorts out their problems, some Gorons move into the town and begin to help rebuild. Somewhat oddly, the graveyard is connected to the Zoras, and is the resting place of the Zora Tunic. Despite the weirdness and the general lack of activities, Kakariko has an alright story, and you do have to keep coming back here for a hodgepodge of reasons. It's not bad, but it's too disappointing and disjointed to be ranked any higher on my list. Number 24, Kokiri Forest, Ocarina of Time. This is another pillar of Zelda history. Not only is it the original home of the Deku Tree and Link's first ever hometown, but it's the very first three-dimensional town. It's also the very first thing you experience in the game, and I imagine the designers put a lot of thought into how best to kickstart players' experience on the new system. The beginning of every title really sets the tone for the rest of the game, which by the way is another video I'm currently working on. The Legend of Zelda begins with a choice and an invitation to explore. A Link to the Past begins in media res, asking Link to infiltrate a hostile castle during a dark and stormy night. But the first ever 3D game begins in a town, which I think really helped to cement the place of towns as core elements of the series. It's hard to reflect back now on how foreign 3D gameplay was at the time, but Kokiri Forest was the perfect environment for players to test out controls and explore the newfangled Z-axis. Kokiri Forest also introduced us to the Kokiri, a race that apparently later evolved or were transformed into the gnarled Koroks. The Kokiri live in treehouses and have fairy companions and never grow up, just like Peter Pan, which if you didn't know was part of the original inspiration for Link and his green tunic. Notable Kokiri include Link's childhood friend Saria, who later awakens as the sage of the forest, and Mido, the obnoxious braggart whose main trait is jealousy of Link's relationship with Saria. Leaving the forest is a big moment in the game, not only because Saria gives you your first ocarina, but because it really feels like you've graduated to a wider world of adventure. Like all the towns in Ocarina of Time, Kokiri Forest is later affected by Ganondorf's hostile takeover of Hyrule. The Deku Tree is killed by Ganondorf's curse. Monsters infest and overrun the forest village. Saria disappears, and Mido seems to regret his youthful douchebaggery. But after Link completes the Forest Temple, some hope returns to the Kokiri, and a new Deku Tree sprouts in the forest. By the end of the game, you won't remember it as the best town in Ocarina of Time, but it was the perfect playground for players to test out the rules of a whole new universe. Number 23, Horon Village, Oracle of Seasons. 
Horon Village is the central hub town in Oracle of Seasons, and at this point I think it's worth talking more about that concept in general, because of the 22 towns I've ranked higher, at least 12 of them would be considered fellow central hub towns. That's not an accident. The simplest reason that these towns shine above the rest is that you spend the most time there. They often feature elements that motivate the player to return, like shops, secrets, and quests that slowly advance over the course of the game. Expect a central hub town to feature a piece of heart in plain sight that you can't quite reach yet because you're missing... something. It's also not uncommon for these towns to host the final dungeon, which lies in wait the entire game. Usually central hubs are also dynamic, meaning they change and evolve over the course of the game. As such, some of the most in-depth quests and side stories are to be found in central hub towns, and many are fan favorites. As a central hub, Horon Village is fine. It constantly flashes between the four seasons and features gardens, fields, and a public fountain. It's populated by a village artist, a frazzled clockmaker, and a horticulturalist mayor who specializes in gasha seeds. There's a shop with a members-only back room, a few secret areas, and the home of Bippin and Blossom, a traveling couple whose son grows up differently depending on Link's choices. The most important resident is the Meku Tree, who hands out plot advice whenever Link wakes him up. This version of the Meku Tree is male, and is significantly less fun than his female counterpart in ages, but whatever. In other news, I'm also handing out the third shop award, although this one's a bit of a joint deal, because this shop appears in two separate towns. The shop is Vasu Jewelers, aka The Ring Shop. I just think this is a really cool part of the Oracle games. There's an insane amount of magic rings, and it's extremely unlikely slash potentially impossible that you'll collect them all, but they have various effects that range from funny to useful like a ring that transforms Link into an Octorok, or one that allows him to punch. They also carry over when you begin a Linked game, and in fact you have to complete a Linked game to have a chance at getting them all. Vasu doesn't typically sell you rings, but he appraises the ones you find and buys your duplicates. Mostly I think it's neat, because when you walk in the door, you expect it to be just another building with flavor text, but it's actually a fully-fledged game mechanic and collect-a-thon. Number 22. Kakariko Village, Link Between Worlds. It's impossible to talk about this town without reference to its namesake in Link to the Past. We may possibly be due for a similar experience with Breath of the Wild 2, but this was the first time that a Zelda game borrowed an exact game world from another game in the series. Kakariko Village is situated in the exact same spot and features essentially the same design as the original, but makes a few minor changes, in addition to the upgraded graphics and remixed sound. The main additions are a small shop, some minor secrets, more dialogue, and the milk bar. The milk bar is pretty cool, and it comes with live music, as some musicians in the back play scaled down mixes of classic Zelda tunes. I've obviously ranked this lower than the original, but that's only because I feel some credit is owed to the originator of the design. It's hard to argue that the sequel is not a technical and experiential improvement. It's also basically the only town in Link Between Worlds, although I will say the shopping scene here is completely eclipsed by Ravio's shop, which is not located in any town. It was nice to see a familiar place, and I did enjoy the updated look but one could have hoped for a bit more originality. Nonetheless, I feel confident placing it in the top third of this list. Number 21. Kakariko Village, A Link to the Past. These are just too similar. It didn't feel right to separate them in the ranking. That said, I have to give the nod to the original, because it laid down the template, not just for the Link Between Worlds version, but for basically every Zelda town. Yes, you can make the argument that video game design is iterative, and even slight improvements technically equal better design, but what can I say? You don't mess with the OG. Anyway, Kakariko Village is the first example of a town as we know it. It was the first to feature a top-down perspective, the first town with a shop, and the first town with its own theme music. For those reasons alone, Kakariko earns a history icon, but that's not all. It's also the very first Kakariko Village, a concept that spawned five future reimaginings to date. This version didn't have any of the Sheikah flavor associated with some other versions, but it did introduce the Kakariko theme, which is a relaxing classic, and it also underscored the village's undying devotion to Kukos. The reason I didn't rank this higher is mostly down to the ongoing battle between nostalgia, story, and technical excellence. This town is top 5 in nostalgia, but it doesn't have much of a story, and it's not really that exciting. My actual top 5 hits it out of the park in all three of those categories, so nostalgia only counts for so much on its own. That said, Kakariko Village is by no means a bad town. As countless indie games have shown, this art style holds up remarkably well, and there's a fair few secrets tucked away here. It's the central hub and essentially the only town in Link to the Past, so you'll return here a lot. And every time you do, the 16-bit village theme will be there to welcome you home. Thanks for watching part 5. 
There's only two parts left in this series, but I'm still working on some other ideas as well. Feel free to subscribe to the channel or like this video if you want to keep following along, or leave me a comment with suggestions or thoughts or predictions or shock at the placement of towns in this video. I hope you're enjoying this look back. Thanks again for watching, and see you in the next one.